Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the last talk in this track. Um, I've been working as a um, freelance coach, consultant, and also developer for the last 12 years now, this year. Um, yeah, and I've been in a lot of different projects, and in almost all of them I had to deal with some form of legacy code. And yeah, so today I want to tell you one method of dealing with legacy code. Um, the Mikado method is something that I learned pretty recently, and it works really well. But first of all, what's legacy code? Um, Mike Feather says it's code without tests. And the idea behind that is, if we don't have an easy way to verify that the code does what it's supposed to do, or even an easy way to find out what the code should do, then um, if we don't have that, then we don't really know what the code does. And we also, when we change the code, we cannot easily verify that we didn't break anything. So, um, yeah, while I agree with that definition, something is missing. So, um, I, I stumbled across another definition, I think, by J.B. Reinsberger, who said something like, legacy code is code that is valuable to us, but that we are afraid to change for whatever reason. So, and I think that is valuable to us is very important because if the code wasn't valuable, we would just throw it away, right? Okay, so legacy code is um, code that's valuable to us and that we are afraid to change. So, let me show you some bad code. I wrote it a couple of years ago as a starting point for refactoring exercises. And I wrote it in Java, and then some people loved it so much, or hated it so much, I don't know, um, that they translated it to different programming languages. So if you want to do this exercise in C Sharp or C++ or JavaScript, you can do today. We're looking at the Java version. And you can find all the versions on GitHub. So yeah, here's some bad code. It's... Um, reasonably short. It's really just 160 lines of code. Um, it's um, Java and even pretty old Java, so I think you could even run this in Java 5 or something really old um, and it would work. Uh, yeah, and it's an application that shows a timer. Let me quickly close this presentation mode. So it's called Baby Steps Timer um, because you could use it for another exercise, for a TDD exercise called Taking Baby Steps, where you always try to fix something in two minutes. So it's really just a timer. It's really small on this screen, but it counts down from two minutes. And um, if you fix um, whatever you're supposed to do within the two minutes, you can press reset, and then it's green and starts counting again immediately. And if the timer runs out, it turns red and sounds a bell and tells you that you basically failed. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's a really simple app, and it's reasonably short. I mean, here it has 180 lines of code, but it's actually shorter than that. Um, yeah, and it, it contains some things that are strange. <laughs> like, it's a Java Swing application, but it actually renders HTML inside a Swing window. And so it's, it's the, the code where you, you look at it, you come into a new company, you see the code, and you think, why did they do that? And <laughs> As with all legacy code, the, uh, the answer is, don't ask. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I did that on purpose to make it more difficult in this case. But most of the time, stuff like that just happens. Somebody didn't, didn't really take care or it was a product of the time. People, I, I really think that people usually do the best they can under their circumstances. So maybe there was a lot of stress. Maybe um, 
the software architect was sick, I don't know, but somebody wrote a GUI that is rendering HTML in a swing window, and yeah. There are some other things in this code that are um, not how you would usually do it, like for example, how it does threading. So I think I'm switching, gonna switch back to presentation mode here so that it can actually read something. There's this timer thread here. That's not only a timer thread, this thing basically contains all the business logic or most of the business logic and even some of the rendering code. So, yeah, it's really bad. And one of the difficult things about this piece of code is that whenever you try to pull some string somewhere, something else in a completely different place breaks. So, also like it is in typically legacy code. Okay, so we have this code, and I've already said I, I don't like how this timer thread is working here, and it's inside the main class. It, it's just a, a very clear um, a violation of the separation of concerns or the single responsibility principle. So I want to move this timer thread out. That's what I want to do today in the next 12 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, okay, so we can start to refactor, right? No. <laughs> um, you, you remember legacy code is code without tests, and as, um, it's always a good idea before um, starting to work on a piece of code like that to write at least some tests. You can probably never be um, complete in that, but it's a good idea, and especially for the Mikado method, it's necessary that we can quickly verify if some refactoring was successful or not. So let's add some tests to this piece of code. I will not write them, but um, the idea is uh, to write some tests without changing this code. And in this case, that's really difficult because um, you see that everything is static. Um, a lot of code is in the main method of this class, so um, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit challenging, but you, you actually can write some um, integrated tests or some tests that are testing the user visible be behavior by just making this JTEXT pane not private. So if I remove the private here, then I can test a lot of things because um, this JTEXT pane contains almost all the user interface and also the, the hyperlink listeners that are listening for the button clicks and stuff like that. So um, this JTEXT pane is my testing seam, and now let's write some tests. Um, so I wrote a couple of tests now. <laughs> Why do, okay, it's just slow. Okay, what I actually did is um, I made this uh, thing package protected, then wrote some tests, and they were really, really slow because um, the timer was still uh, accessing just the, the current time of my system. So I wrote some tests and then created a a, a wall clock class so that I can speed the tests up, and then I wrote some more tests. So now I have um, a couple of tests, and how can I run them? Run, I want to run the all tests. Is that doing something? Yeah. So here we have eight tests, and they are still a little bit flaky because of all the strange threading things. So here you see that one test um, was ignored because a precondition for the test wasn't ready. So let's just start them again and hope that they are green now. So that's a problem that you also see often in uh, when you're dealing with legacy code, that you're, uh, even if you manage to bring the code under test, some of the tests might be uh, flaky, they might fail for no reason, and so on. This is why all of these tests are testing their preconditions and just ignore the test if, if the precondition is not valid. 
Um, but I have at least some tests, and now I can start to refactor. So how do I do that? I want to use the Mikado method. Mikado is a game. Who knows Mikado? Everyone. Nice. <laughs> so basically, you have a couple of sticks, and you want to remove sticks from um, this pile without, uh, so that no other stick moves. And they have different point values. So the, the Mikado is the highest value stick, and I think it's the one with the um, spiral pattern. But in this case, you obviously can't remove this spiral pattern stick uh, because other sticks would move, and you have to think about which one to remove first. And if one moves, then you have lost, or no, you just lose points, right? Haven't played it in years. Okay, so how would you play Mikado if you had a time machine? You would, of course, just go for the Mikado, write down which other sticks have moved, go back in time and try one of the sticks that moved, write down again which other sticks have moved until you get to a point where you can safely remove one. Okay, so with a time machine, playing Mikado is um, pretty easy, and you can uh, remove the whole pile without um, ever moving a stick. So, and we can apply this principle to our code because we have a time machine. I use Git. You could use one with a better command line interface, but all the ones with good ones, like Mercurial, have lost, so Let's use Git. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, and to do that, we need some, some way of, oh, that's not, some way of, of, of writing down what we want to do. So I want to move the timer thread to its own class. This is my Mikado, the thing I want to do. And because I have a time machine, I just try that. So I go to the baby steps timer, to the timer thread, wherever it is, and I'm going to press F6, which is the move command of IntelliJ, and move it to the upper level, and I want to call this class, or this file, timer thread. And Nobody reads warnings, right? Just do it. <laughs> and we see that we have a couple of compiler errors. So I don't even have to run my test. I already know that it failed. What I have to do now is find out why it failed, write that down, go back in time, try again. So um, I'm not going to write down every compiler error here, uh, just the interesting ones. And there are two groups of things that failed. You can see things like timer running, current cycle start time, and the, the, the last remaining time. All of this is part of the business logic, how the timer calculates what to display. So I want to move those three things into the timer thread. And then you see another group of, of things that have failed, like... Um, here, the body background uh, color or what actually is already displayed. This is part of the view logic, so I want to extract this into another class. Okay, so let's write that down. I want to move the timer management to the timer thread and everything else that failed to a rendering interface. Now I'm going back in time. Um, do I still have that? Yeah. So check out and clean everything. And now we should be safe again, or not. Hello, IntelliJ. The timer thread doesn't exist anymore. Go away. <gasps> no. Ah, oh, come on. 
Shouldn't this control F4, control alt F4? How can I close something without? <gasps> oh, did he? Yeah, it did something strange. Thanks. Um, so, okay. The baby steps timer, and it actually shouldn't have any compiler errors anymore. Now it's clean again. OK, so I went back in time, and the idea would be to just move these three things that are part of the business logic uh, into the timer thread. So this is timer running, and the current cycle start time and the last remaining time. Uh, and move this into timer thread. And now I have no compiler errors, I think, so I can run the tests. And the tests are green. So I did that. The other thing, the rendering interface is more complicated, but it's immediately doable too. So you can imagine that this could become a tree. In this case, it didn't become a tree because both things were immediately doable. So I'm, I'm going to show you the end result later. So now this was doable, and I tried to remove the, uh, the Mikado again. I tried to move the timer thread to its own class, and I saw two more problems. Like that there is some stop and reset logic in the timer thread that would not be accessible anymore if I move it, and uh, that I have to pass this new renderer that I just created as a constructor parameter to the timer thread. So these are also two things that I can easily do before moving the uh, before moving the class to a new, new file, so I can create two methods there: stop and reset, uh, two public methods, and I can create the constructor parameter, and um, then again after that uh, I can I'm in in a state where I can move the timer thread without any compiler errors. So let's see that. So this is so after those refactorings there is the timer thread. And it has all these functions. It has a stop timer, a reset timer and it uses a timer renderer to get the current color, get the current time caption, and to update the GUI. So, yeah, after this, we are done with this refactoring, and we did it in safe steps where we could undo every step that failed and just go back in time and start over again. So, oh no, wrong window. So before I come to my conclusion, I think we have some questions we on Slido. Did we have some questions? We have some. And feel free to add your questions now. Yeah. We have some questions. Uh, just add yours. And <laughs> yeah. What do you say, David? <laughs> the first one I like most. Yeah. <laughs> so. Number one, um, this happens to me too, so I'm not sure if you can completely avoid it, but um, taking care of technical practices like test-driven development, continuous refactoring, continuous attention to design can help with that. And especially pair programming or mob programming can help with that. So I'm always amazed how much it helps me to discuss things with other people. Um, 
how much it helps me in my own thinking. Is, yeah, is that enough? Yeah, Is I think the, yeah. so. Simon has asked also a very good question because the Mikado can be really, really huge. What's your yeah. thought on that? I mean, still trying to do Mikado? I think it's still a good idea. Um, because what else would you do? Uh, you, uh, you can, of course, try to refactor by compile error. So just do something and then fix the compiler errors until, until you don't have any until you have, don't have them anymore. But the problem there is that this could take potentially a really, really long time until you get to the point where you can test again. So if you refactor by compile error, I, I had this in the past where I had two or three days until I could test again, and then, of course, all the tests failed. So I think the Mikado method is still the safer choice here. It might take longer or exactly as long, but it's probably safer. One more question you want to take? I actually have one here which I like, which is probably in the front. The <laughs> problem is if you kind of start with the tree, hmm? you go one step down, another step down, kind of, are you at the end, kind of like uh, at the wrong pass? Kind of how to prevent that? How to avoid that you forgot about your initial objective? Ever ran well, into that? The, the important thing here, if you want to try that method, is to really write down your main goal and the things that prevent you from doing it. So really write that tree down on a large piece of paper or in a text file or somewhere. But it's really, at the end, you want to have a checklist where you can put marks um, after everything that worked, uh, yeah. Are you committing after each step? Yes, otherwise this would not work. It's um, essentially just as when you do test-driven development, you can commit every time the tests are green. And you probably should do that because then you can, um, whenever you run into a dead end, you can just undo. So, and the nice thing with Git, I mean, I'm sometimes talking not nicely about Git, but the cool thing about Git is that you can just squash all those commits before pushing, maybe not after pushing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you, you still have only, only one public commit, but you have your, your save points. Like when you're playing a game, you have your save points and you can go back in time if something that you, um, that you tried didn't work out. So yeah, you, especially in the Mikado method, you must commit every time you're green because otherwise this breaks down. You cannot go back in time when you don't have a commit that you can go back to. Last question, when to refactor and when to rewrite? Is there any idea or what's your suggestion on that? Um, or, um, so, yeah, it depends, I, it depends usually. It, it depends and I think it depends mostly on um, when you know exactly what that thing does, then you can safely rewrite, and most of the time when you're dealing with legacy code, you don't know that. So um, I've seen a lot of, re or some rewrite efforts that took like twice as long or three times as long as planned, because there were so many unknowns in the old code um, that were just discovered during the rewrite, where then some customer said like, but that's not how it worked before. Um, yeah. So in, in those cases, when you don't know exactly what it does, then often refactoring is the, the safer choice. I like that, actually. I like that. Never thought that, that refactoring makes much more sen if, sense if I don't know exactly what it does. But at mm. this point, we want to come to the conclusion. Yeah, Thank you okay. for the questions. So David will summarize up everything now. OK. But I don't have my slides yet. But on the other hand, I don't really need them. OK, I have. <laughs> so the idea is uh, that working with legacy code can be very frustrating. And even if you wrote the code yourself, it can be frustrating to go back and see what you, what you did. And when, when others wrote the code and you don't even know all the decisions that went into that code, it can be even more frustrating. 
and it can even be dangerous, so you might break things um, that other, others were relying on without even noticing it. So in, in the refactoring I showed you, this refactoring actually broke some functionality. So if you do it on your own, you can try out um, what it was. Uh, because you, yeah, even if you write tests after the fact, you cannot be sure if you tested all the important parts. You cannot be 100% sure, but you can be careful about that. But refactoring legacy code or being able to work with legacy code can be very um, rewarding and valuable because the code that we work on is valuable to the company. They are earning money with it. Otherwise, there would be no point in maintaining it. So I, I hope the code, <laughs> if you work on really bad code, I hope it is, it's at least making money. Uh, and then being able to deal with that code um, can be very valuable. And with the Mikado method, you have um, one method that gives you some safety net when working with legacy code. So yeah, that, that was it from me. I, I hope you've learned something interesting. I, um, as I've said, I've been working as a freelance coach and consultant for the last 12 years or so. So if you need, want to improve your technical practices or if you need some help with legacy code, just ask me. I might be able to help or know others who can. And I also wrote two books so far. Um, none of them is exactly about the topic, but if you have a lot of legacy code, then you might be interested in the book about agile anti-patterns because you maybe also will find some of those anti-patterns in your company. So thanks for being here. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll only be here today, so if you want to talk to me, um, now would be a good time. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Big applause, please.